How long do you think it took? 60 years and quit, quit giving away my punchlines. Don't do that anymore. 60 years, 60 years. Those of you who've seen the movie do not give away the punchlines. Okay. Now it sounds like a gross exaggeration and it is. They only looked for about 30 years. This is where Ivy made the mistake. They only looked for about 30 years and then they gave it up. And they said it has to be extinct now. And then 30 years later, Teddy Roosevelt's sons are out there doing some sport hunting and they kill one. Okay? So then they mounted up again knowing that they, it's for real now. And because they had learned so much in the interim, they began to get them. And over the next 20 years, they brought in six. And we have the panda craze, you know, that we have today. But even to this day, they're extremely difficult to go out into the wilds of Sichuan Province, China, and bring in a wild panda. Now, what is the panda doing that makes it so difficult to get one? Well, as you can see, it's very brightly colored and stands out very distinctively against its green background. It lives during the day. It eats a very restricted diet, bamboo. It's very slow moving. You see them move in zoos. They're as stupid as a bag of hammers. They can't even reproduce in zoos. Can't even find each other and, or figure it out. I mean, <laughs> how, how stupid do you have to be? Anyway, the point is, they're not doing anything. They're living their lives, and the problem lies with us. We can't hack it in their world very easily. We think we're masters again of the world. We're not. We're not. And where they live is where the hominoids live. And the hominoids are bigger, faster, stronger, operate at night, eat anything in their world. They can hear better, see better, and I'm absolutely sure think better than we can. We're not going to just mount up and go get one because we've tried it many times and it hasn't worked. We're only going to see them by accident, encounter them by accident. And that's when it happens, and it happens a lot. We have good evidence on record of these encounters. Next slide. We're going to go over a few. The famous Patterson film, Roger Patterson took a film of a female hominoid walking along a creek, creek bank in 1967, October. You all saw this, well, not all, but some of you saw this recently on a television program called World's Greatest Hoaxes. All right, that itself was a hoax. That program was a hoax. I, I wrote a long email about this, and it's on my site if you'd like to read it, www.lloydpie.com. It's a defense of the Patterson film showing what they did not talk about in that program, trying to make this film look like a hoax and pick on it, as people will do occasionally. There's no doubt that this is a bona fide film for a number of reasons we're going to go over. All right, first of all, it was a bright, sunny day, as you can see. What happened was the sun was shining such that it was glinting off of her shoulder and thigh as she walked, and you could see her muscles rippling in her shoulder, in her thigh, as she walks. In good slow-mo close-up, you can see that, which they did not provide in that, uh, in that program. All right, if that's a person in a suit, the suit has to be glued to naked skin. In the gluing process, you lose that flexibility, that ripple. The only thing that looks like this does in this film is real skin under, I mean real skin over real muscle working. So we could stop right here, it's real just based on that. Right there, but we don't have to stop. The arm, if you've all seen her walk, she walks along like this. She drags her arm down around her knees where everybody says, she, you know, the hominoids do. Why? The elbow articulates right here, which is much longer from shoulder to elbow than a human. If that's a human in a suit, impossible. You can't get an elbow bend at the same point. So we could stop right there. Solid proof that that's not a human being in a suit. But furthermore, Jerry Romney, the guy they said was in the suit, they stuck him with breasts. What would they do that for? Why go to the problem? Why go to the trouble? As she walks along and she turns back to face him, you see the breasts sway and she takes a couple of steps and you see that nice jiggle that we all know. <laughs> if it's a person in a suit in 1967, it's going to be those early silicone jobs. Remember those? <laughs> Absolutely real right there. Furthermore, she left tracks in the hard-packed sand of the creek bed. One inch deep, we have 
pictures, we have casts. That cast you saw earlier of the cast in the foot, that was her foot. No question, inch deep, walked a 200 pound man beside her not long after, he sank about a quarter of an inch. So we know that as she stood there doing this, she weighed 600 to 800 pounds. Fake that. That's got to be a real lead line suit. <laughs> 600 to 800 pounds as she walks. So we know that it was a legitimate film. Furthermore, as they pointed out in the program, with the fake films, they can never tell you where it happened and who did it, who took it, because they don't want that guy to be grilled and they don't want experts to go and measure one limb here and know how long, how tall it really was. What Patterson did was he went right out fast as he could and begged every expert in the area that he could call, every anthropologist and zoo person, come out, bona fide sighting, please bring dogs. And you don't want to bring dogs because these things have a very powerful body odor that even, even tracking dogs will recoil from. If it's a person in a suit, it's like the suit's not even there. The dogs are after it. Patterson did, of course, no expert came. Needless to say, they never do. You can't get them to go because they know what will happen. A young man named Grover Krantz went out early in his career as an anthropologist, took a look at one, and he said, it looks real to me. And it's 30-some-odd years later, and I think he's still trying for tenure. <laughs> They've made a tremendous example out of Grover Krantz for what happens to people who side with the enemy in this issue, which is a very volatile, very sensitive issue. Okay, So no experts would come, needless to say. Patterson did everything right that he could except film something that could be real. Other than that, he was great. Okay, next slide. A man named Albert Osman, picture taken 1957, talking about an event that occurred to him 33 years earlier in 1924 when he was a young man, a timber cruiser in the woods of southern British Columbia. He's taking some time off. He's out looking for gold mines, lost gold mines. He's sleeping in his sleeping bag one night, and suddenly Big Hand picks him up, shoves him to the bottom of the bag, slings him over its back like Santa's bag of toys, and scoops up his camp stores with the other hand and walks off with him. He is captured by a Bigfoot. He has marched for about an hour. He's got barely enough room at the top of the bag to breathe. The hand couldn't get quite around the bag, so he had enough room to breathe, but he stuck down the bottom of it. It dumps him out an hour later or so, and he's in a 10-acre basin of high, high rock walls where he can't get out, and there's one opening opposite where he is, and over there is the, the den of the, the living quarters of the male Bigfoot that got him, his mate, and their two offspring, a young male and a young female. And Albert Osman stays with them for six days before he can figure out a way to escape, which is very funny, very clever. Not going to go into it. Takes too long to tell. It's in the book, okay? But he gets away. The point of the story is not how funnily he escapes, but that he doesn't tell anybody for 33 years. Keeps it to himself, thinking everybody would think he was crazy, which they wouldn't do. And then in 1957, he reads an affidavit in a, in a paper by a man who saw one picking berries. And the man said, well, if anybody has an experience like this, would you share it with me? So Osman writes him a letter and says, that's what happened to me. Well, when people found out what happened to him, the roof fell in on the poor guy. Experts came in from all over the world. He had to take lie detector tests up the wazoo. You know how it works. And so you know that when you're telling a story, a long, detailed story, and it's a lie, you can't keep the details straight. You're going to goof it up, and they're going to figure it out. Sooner or later, you're telling a lie. He never goofed up. He passed all his lie detector tests. No, anybody that had anything to do with him, just read the testimonies, say he was absolutely A-plus straight-up guy, telling a true story. Next slide. The famous Minnesota Iceman. Ice Child is more like it. This was a juvenile Bigfoot killed by a man named Frank Hansen in the woods of northern Minnesota. Ironically, in 1967, the same year that Patterson filmed his Bigfoot 2,000 miles away. All right? Now, Frank Hansen shot it in the back, blew out that nice hole in its chest, dropped it, severed its spine, dropped it down. It pulled its arm up to protect its face from him, as you can imagine, shot it through the wrist, through the left eye, blew the right eye out onto its cheek, and blew out the back of its head. Coup de gras, killed it dead. At that moment, 1967, Frank Hansen could have changed history. He could have taken this thing, crammed it down the throats of science, and we would not be having this discussion today. We would all accept hominoids as a reality from that point forward. No problem. But Frank Hansen was not that kind of man. The kind of man he was, 
He saw the opportunity. He bought a seven-foot floor freezer. He threw the body in there. He filled it.